Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Good. Awesome. Well, we just want you guys to be aware of all the stuff that's going on. We've got lots going on this week and in the coming weeks. So uh, in your bulletins, uh, some of these are repeats. That's okay. You can't hear some of these enough. Um, but there's some inserts in here for you guys to fill out. The one is the student ministry stuff that we've got going on. Uh, on the one side, it's the quiet time order. I know we've had lots of people order quiet times. Uh, make sure you get that order in here very soon so that we can get that order in and get them all here before the new quiet times start. Uh, this is anybody ages four and up, uh, and even if you think you've got an advanced three-year-old, they can probably do that too. Uh, it's like coloring pages and stuff, so I know uh, we talked about Randall loving to uh, color the coloring pages with his quiet time in the morning. Uh, anyway, so that's great, and it's an awesome tool for family devotions too. We've talked about this before, but when the whole family is in the same passage of Scripture at the same time, uh, it makes it really easy to talk about what God is teaching you in your quiet time, and then we're all on the same page as a church as well. Uh, so that order. On the other side, we've got for the uh, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, the clubs and Sunday school uh, positions. If you can help with that, go ahead and, and put that on there. I have heard uh, murmurings uh, that some of you think on Wednesday nights you can be there, but it not consistently, or you know you might not be able to be there the whole night, or whatever it is. If that is you, go ahead and fill this out still and write that on there. Run right, write, you know, not consistent, or I may have to be late, or whatever it is, uh, so that we can at least get an idea of that. Speaking of which, uh, we've got two different dates we want you to be aware of if you are helping with the Wednesday night Word of Life clubs. This is the, the Gopher Buddies, Olympians, and Teens. Uh, if you are helping with those, we've got two dates. The one is the annual planning meeting. Uh, that's going to be on Friday, August 16th in the evening. We'll have dinner and then go in and do our planning, getting all of that stuff ready. And then August 23rd and 24th is the uh, Leadership Development Conference. It's LDC. This is Word of Life leaders using the same material from all over Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina are coming together for a conference. Uh, we want to get some information about that conference to you. So if, if you are helping on Wednesday nights, if you can help, if you're interested, whatever, meet down here after the service and we'll get some of that information to you, talk about it, and you can ask some questions too because I've heard some questions uh, out there about that. So meet here after the service if you are working on the Wednesday nights uh, with uh, the, the Gopher Buddies, Olympians, or teenagers. Uh, the other insert we've got here is for the uh, ladies' ministry, the Women of Grace. Uh, this is about their small groups uh, and the, the information there. I know that information was handed out to you guys uh, at one of your ladies' Bible studies on the Wednesday nights. Uh, so if you guys fill this out, put it in the offering plate, uh, we can get that to the ladies' ministry leaders, and they can get all of the small group stuff going. If you've got any questions, you can see Miss Belinda about that. Um, the last thing we want to talk about is care groups. So tonight we've got care groups like normal all over the place. Uh, so be at a care group. If you don't know what care group to go to, you can see one of us, Pastor Jeremy or myself, will point you in the right direction. But next week, it's August 4th. That means it's our combined care group and the August one we always go up to Simply Natural Creamery. So we're going to meet at the creamery at 6 o'clock. If you would like to carpool or just drive along, follow somebody, meet at the church at 515, uh, and then we'll head that way together. Or you can just meet us there at 6. So that's what that is next Sunday, the uh, Simply Natural Creamery. Uh, with that, make sure you do grab a bulletin. There's lots of other information in there. Uh, and I want to read a card right here before we uh, move on with our service. This is from the Carvers. Uh, it says, Dear CBC, thank you so much for your prayers and thoughts during Uncle Leonard's illness. He left this world peacefully, and praise God, we'll see him in heaven one day. You have all been such a blessing to our family. Uh, that made things even more special. We love you all, Aaron and Lori Carver. So thank you all for, for praying with them, especially this last week uh, with everything going on with Uncle Leonard and his passing. Uh, with that, let's all stand up, greet one another while the praise team comes uh, to lead us in worship. <laughs>
when he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone.
You may be seated. Lord, we do thank you for your power. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to stand in our own strength. Lord, we thank you for your death on the cross for us. We thank you for salvation, Lord, and we just pray that, Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know you, Lord, that they would uh, just accept you, Lord, today. Lord, today is the day of salvation. Lord, we just pray that as we receive the offering this morning, Lord, that uh, you would be with the gift, Lord, that you would take it and you would further it as you see fit. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tammy. Good playing. Children's Church, adios. As they uh, make their way out, uh, I would invite you to take your Bibles this morning as we begin a brand new book study. Hallelujah. And... Uh, Normally we do uh, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament. Sometimes we'll sprinkle in a little topic along the way in the middle, break it up somewhat. Um, we are going to go, because we just finished Jude. Though I think we threw in a little topical with some Old Testament stuff somewhere along the way. But anyway, we're going to stay in the New Testament. So with that said, I want you to go to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. And this is where we're going to be. Now, you know how it is here at Community Baptist Church. When we begin a new book study, we have to start by unpacking some background to it. And when you're at home reading your Bible, uh, I hope you're not one of these where you just sit out on the front porch and you say, God, I want to hear from you. And you let the wind blow the pages. And then you look down and you say, oh, a message from the Lord. No, that's not how we read our Bibles, guys. 
Okay? Even if you've gotten some special revelation through the Word of God in that format, please do not make that a habit in your Bible study. What we'd rather do is do what God intended for us to do, and that is to rightly divide the Word of Truth. And so that means we need to study to show ourselves approved, right? I mean, this is God's way of doing things. And so when you begin a new book study, I, I, we should always look at what's taking place in the location that this is being written to. What's the culture like during this time period? What are some of the issues that are being addressed? And so if we understand a good historical background, a good cultural background of the audience who's receiving the letter. We can understand some of the cultural practices of the day and things that were happening in the time period. Then we're going to be more likely, more apt to be able to rightly divide it. Because here's what happens when we do that. We begin to understand what God was wanting that audience, that original audience, to know from that letter being written to them. And then we can jump across time to the culture and age in which we live in and those principles and those truths will carry over to where we are today so that we can rightly apply it. It's very important that when we study the Word of God, we don't go to the Word of God and say, well, Randall, what do you think this is saying to you? Luke, what do you think this passage is saying to you? Honestly, I love Luke and Randall, but I don't really care what they think it's saying to them. I want to know what it's saying. What was the author's original intent? What did he mean when he sent it? Because, trust me, the author has an intent. And that's what we want to discover. And so as we study the Word of God, this helps us understand it. So today, we're not going to get very far. I can promise you that, at least as far as the text goes. We're going to unpack some history, some background information, so that hopefully that helps us better understand what's going on, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to glean some application. Uh, you've heard it said before, one interpretation, many applications. Okay, Because we're all in different places, and so in the sense of the truth may apply to your situation, it's still the same truth, but uh, one interpretation many applications. Good thing to remember. All right, with that said, let's take a look at Paul's letter to the Colossians. Now, one thing too, you want to, when you're reading a book, go through it. I, I always encourage, sit down one setting and read through it. Just read through it. God bless you all the way through, right? And you'll, you'll just in that one setting and think about what is the main point? What, what is being said here? So if I were to ask you, what's the main point of Colossians? What is it, the Apostle Paul, if you were there at the Colossae Church, what is it he wants you to get from this letter? And if I were to surmise it, it's this here. And this is the title of our series, The Preeminence of Christ. The Preeminence of Christ. Paul is going to address this throughout this letter no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the problem, no matter what the struggle, no matter how good or great things are going, here's one thing we must remember, church. It's that we have Christ-centered lives because it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about Community Baptist Church. It's about Christ. To God be the glory. It's all about Christ. Every breath we take, every moment we wake up, every day He gives us, it's about Jesus Christ. Let Christ have preeminence. He needs to be priority in our life. Because if Christ is priority number one, we're not easily duped by the lies of this world, the vain philosophies that may come your way, to try and lead you down a path of the tradition of men or the wisdom of man. These are some of the things that Paul's going to tackle as uh, he writes this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So let's begin with that in mind. Some background information. Who wrote it? When you're looking at a book, first thing you want to know, who wrote it? Well, I've already given it away. 
Who wrote it, church? Paul. Paul wrote it. Um, who was it written to? Well, again, I'm, I'm, I hear some of you saying the answer already, but here's the other thing. Why was it written? And again, some of these we sort of briefly answered, but here's the great thing about this letter. God's already told us in the very first two verses. Uh, who wrote it? Who was it written to? Notice, if you would, in the Word of God, Colossians 1, verse 1 and verse 2. I, Paul, hey, there you go, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timotheus, that's Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray this morning that I will be removed, that I would decrease and that you would increase. I pray that your word would not return void. Lord, I ask that you will be in the center of all that's done here, that you will draw us near to you, that you will have preeminence in the preaching and teaching this morning, in the listening, in the receiving. And so, Lord, be glorified in this place today that we might be conformed more and more to your image, that we will be found faithful, steadfast in the work of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see it here. This is who. The who's answered right there in the very first verse. Who wrote it? Paul wrote it. Who was it written to? It was written to the saints and faithful brethren. And that's not two. That's just the same in one, I believe. That's, uh, you know, again, the, these believers. Saints is the word for believers, right? If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, your new identity in Christ is no longer a sinner. Yes, we sin. But you're not, don't identify yourself. Don't call something unclean that God has called clean. You follow me? God says you are now a saint. Hey, if I'm a dirty, no good for nothing, never going to amount, yeah, you loser, you know, then guess what? I may grow up thinking I'm a loser. I may live out thinking I'm a real loser. If that's what you got called all the time, that's what you were told in your life, you'll never amount to nothing, you'll never do anything, you know what? You start to buy into those lies. So we don't want to listen to the lies, church. We want to listen to the truth. We want to listen to who God says you are. God says, as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have a new identity, you're a saint. Therefore, act like it, right? We should be living out our identity. So this is written to the saints. What else do we know about these saints? Well, they're faithful brethren. That's a pretty good mark of, uh, of, of a life, right? Well, I, I don't know about you, but... I long to hear the words one day when I stand before a holy God. I long to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Church, could that be said about you today? Are you a faithful saint when it comes to the things of God? Are you faithful? Are you holding faithful? Are you being steadfast in the labor and the cause of Christ? Paul is writing to this church at Colossae, and you see it there. And he says, saints, faithful brethren, those of you in Christ at Colossae, grace be unto you. By the way, you can only have grace and peace if you're in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ today, then... Circumstances will destroy you. Troubles will sink you into despair. Problems will overwhelm. And that's not to say that, guys, we don't get hit down as saints. Of course we do. The circumstances are the same around us. The storms rage no different and sometimes even more intense as followers of Christ, right? Sometimes you, you want a troubled life? Become a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then you can almost be guaranteed persecution comes to those who desire to live righteous. But there's a difference. There's a difference 
from where I was in my unsaved state as a sinner living in sin. My happiness was always based on my happenings. But as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, yeah, sometimes life is stinky, sometimes troubles come, sometimes woe is me. But at the end of the day, there is peace in the midst of the storm because I know who's in charge. I know who the sovereign God is. I know that He has made promises to me that He cannot lie about. And so therefore I know, even in the midst of storms, that all things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose. And so I can have that peace, that joy that comes in a right relationship. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way Paul starts right out of the gate. And so he's writing, Paul is, to who? The saints and to the faithful brethren at Colossae. So what about the city of Colossae? What do we know about the city of Colossae? Well, it's located about 100 miles, 120 miles, uh, just east of Ephesus. And as you recall, we just studied through Ephesians in our week-long ministry of uh, local missions. Uh, Cameron had brought a message uh, on Sunday morning from Ephesians 1. Those of you who participated all week long, we went through the entire book of Ephesians. So Colossae is about 100 miles east of Ephesus. You'll see if I can get my pointer to point correctly. There's Ephesus, Colossae. And other things that we know about the city of Colossae. It was located in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. That was my turkey call, Connor. You like that? Maybe that's pretty good, I think. I've been working on it. So. Turkey, modern-day Turkey. That's where Colossae is located. And so there was also some other things about this location that was important. In, in its original day, Colossae and... Um, it was basically part of a tri-city, Hierapolis, and then also there was um, Laodicea. And so there was basically, this is, is sort of the, the, the crossroads of life. And so 3rd and 4th century B.C., it's in its hubbub days. This was the place where all people coming through would trade, and, and, and this was the happening location. Well, fast forward years later, that road became basically not as important We'll look at some reasons why Colossae kind of went off the map. It's no longer the hubbub it once was, and it became a dying city. Part of that was a new road came into play, and this new road was a circular route. And this is very interesting. As we look at the popular route that later would take place in this region, you'll notice Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. This was the main roadway, and many would circulate through this road travel. Anybody recognize those names? Some of you in Larry's class, you better get an A on this one. Yeah, these are the seven churches written, seven cities in the book of Revelation. And so, again, when, the, when John later writes, by the way, he writes from the island of Patmos, right? There's Patmos. That's where John was dipped in hot oil for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and then cast out on that island with a bunch of criminals. The first Alcatraz, if you will. And he wrote the book of Revelation. Again, a letter that would be circulated to the churches. And so there sits Colossae. Now at that time, again, Colossae later would become a dying city. Location in Asia... Again, during the New Testament age, in the Roman province of Asia, there were three important cities in the Lycus Valley. And that's this location here where it's at. It's called the Lycus Valley. This, these, the three main cities of the day in which this is being written, it was, a, again, popular hubbub, right? This is the Tri-City, man. This is the Raleigh-Durham Triangle area right here, all right? This is the happening spot in the, in the, in the region. Hierapolis was a place for health, pleasure, and relaxation. That's where that was. That must have been uh, Chapel Hill. 
Laodicea, known for its commercial trade and politics. It must have been Durham, just saying. Colossae was known simply as a small town. That must have been the NC State campus. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I love you guys. I just had to go with that. Uh-oh, upset somebody. All right. But I want you to understand that, again, this was, this was the happening location. This is where the trade of the world, this is where uh, things were, were happening. Colossae was mostly a pagan city. Um, again, there was a lot of, because it was a crossroads of culture, you've you got to imagine there's a lot of Jewish people coming in. There's a lot of different, again, remember Ephesus and, and the revival that broke out there. And so a lot of those uh, people got upset, you know, because the, the, they were making some pagan worship idol, uh, idolatry type things. Their businesses got shut down. They're mad at Christians. A lot of people scattered throughout. Again, a lot of people come through Colossae uh, carrying some of those pagan practices. And so it was a metropolitan type area, again, a big mixed bag of chips, if you will, all gathered into that one city. The ruins of Colossae, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis were destroyed by earthquake in 17 AD. And so what was once a thriving metropolis was no more. It was destroyed by earthquakes in 17 AD during the reign of Tiberius, and then they rebuild and they try to get things going again and it's destroyed again by earthquake in 60 A.D. during the reign of Nero. And you recall from our study, remember talking about Nero? This is the emperor who was wicked in all his ways, persecuting Christians, lighting them on fire as human torches to light his garden at night. And so uh, under his reign, this place was destroyed again um, by earthquake. By 400 A.D., the city of Colossae no longer existed. The site of Colossae has never been excavated, but there are remains of some buildings today. And I'm curious, I want to ask uh, Ted Wright uh, when he comes in. He's our archaeologist guru. I'm going to ask him, uh, y'all remind me, we'll ask him about Colossae and wonder if there's any efforts to, to, to maybe dig and try to excavate. And so he would probably know uh, uh, the answer to this. But uh, my understanding is this is what became of Colossae. Again, important that I think we understand that. Getting the dynamic of the culture to know that this was, you know, the happening place of its day with, a, with, with all of these different central cities of location of textile and pleasure and health and so forth and so on. So what about the Colossian church? Uh, what do we know about the Colossian church? Well, it was a church plant. Paul did not plant this church. And this is what's interesting about Paul writing this letter. Paul had not, all indications, he had not actually been there and launched this church or started this church. And so it, it was a little different. And that's why part of when he writes, there's an appeal to who he is, an apostle called, right, by the will of God. Unless there's any questions from any of you folks in that church, let me tell you who I am. I'm Paul, the apostle, called, right? So he's establishing that from the, from the get-go. Paul preached in Ephesus. Now this is a very, 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 very important history right here. So if you tuned out, tune in. Paul, in one of his missionary journeys, probably one of his latter journeys, maybe his third missionary journey through, making the rounds through the differing cities, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul preaches in Ephesus, and a man by the name of, of, of Epaphras, or Epaphras, whichever way you want to pronounce it, doesn't bother me, tomato, tomato. Epaphras was saved in Ephesus. He became a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. He was then mentored, discipled by Paul. Hey, here's a good model church, investing in the lives of someone, sharing the gospel. He became a mentor, and for a couple of years, Paul is traveling throughout this area, preaching and teaching, and Epaphras is soaking it up. By the way, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, why are you not soaking up the Word of God? Why are we not like sponges, wanting every opportunity we get to sit under the tutorage of God's Word, to hear, to grow, to want to learn, to want to mature, to want to become more Christ-like? Because when I read the scriptures, that is a marking of the early church, man. They were meeting daily. It 
There was an internal motivation of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude, recognizing sins have been forgiven. I've been saved. I've moved from darkness to light. I've moved from death to life. Eternal life. I've got eternal life. Man, that's good news. Where's the passion, church? Where's the zeal with knowledge? Not zeal without knowledge. He's going to address some zeal without knowledge in the letter. But where's the zeal with knowledge? Where's when we understand and knowing who Christ is and what Christ has done for us, where is the faithfulness? Where is the steadfastness? Where is my get up and go? Has it already got up and gone? Not unless we're in glory. Paul preached. Epaphras was saved. He was mentored by Paul. Then he was sent back to his hometown eventually. And guess where his hometown was? Colossae. So imagine, here's Epaphras, two years under the schooling of the Spirit-filled apostle Paul, learning and growing in Christ so that he comes back to his hometown of Colossae and begins to preach the good news of Jesus Christ around his community of LaGrange, I mean of Colossae. And so it's believed there that that's where the church was planted. It's believed that Epaphras was the one who planted the church in Colossae. Possible, it's possible that he met up with other believers from Acts 2. Don't got time right now, but if you want to read it later, go to Acts 2. You remember, day of Pentecost. There's all these people gathered in for the festival, right? So there's some Jewish people there. And, and, and so here's Peter, he's standing up, he raises his voice, and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many people hear it in their own language, their own tongue, speaking in tongues, right? An actual known language. And they're converted. Acts 2 talks about, and there were some from this area, Phrygia. Some of the other areas that, that if you look at the map, again, modern-day Turkey, from Colossae, from that region, from that area, it says specifically there in Acts 2 that they were added to the church. They were saved. So it's possible, and this is, again, just filling in the blanks. This is why we study the whole counsel of God. We can, we can make a good assumption that those people, when they return back home to Colossae, they're there in that town as well, they're in that region, and when... Epaphras comes back into Colossae and begins to proclaim this message of Jesus Christ, no doubt some others are like, yes, yes, we believe, we heard this. And they probably begin to meet together to discuss and talk about the things and hear from Epaphras the things he had been learning from the Apostle Paul. And, and so they begin a house church. They begin a church. Pretty exciting. Here's the passage of Scripture, again, that we look to to help establish this conversion of Epaphras. And this continued, this is in Acts 19, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia, again, Asia Minor, this is that region, that whole big area, and again, that circular rotation of all these places bringing the gospel, Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, as we read through this letter, you're going to find that the majority of these people are most likely Gentiles. There's Jews there. We know that for certain because of some of the things that will be addressed. But it's a mixture and, and probably predominantly. And why, do, why would I say that? Why would I assume? Is it just an assumption or is it an educated, informed hypothesis? Would that be right? Yeah. Anyway. So why would I assume that? Why would I say that? Well, if it was simply a Jewish audience, Paul, no doubt, would have reasoned from the Old Testament. You had a lot of Old Testament references in the letter, just like when you see Paul's other writings when he's got a predominantly Jewish audience and he makes those appeals because it was his practice, it was his custom, as we see in Acts. When he would go into a new town, he'd go where first? Synagogue. And he'd open the scripture and he would expound from the Old Testament why Christ is a fulfillment. By the way, if you want a good uh, YouTube video to watch just released recently, I, I, I was telling Tyson about this yesterday, um, that 
Ben Shapiro sat down and did an interview with Ravi Zacharias. Now, Ben Shapiro is not a believer. He's a Jewish, he, he, he's a Jewish man. And Ravi Zacharias and him have a great exchange. Now, again, for, for you guys that aren't Bible nerds, you probably are, you know, you know are, are, are philosophy. Yeah, you're probably not going to be really excited about it, but I, I was pretty excited about it. I, I, I would say watch it, though. There's some great stuff in there. Paul took the gospel. Epaphras was saved. He planted a church. So why was it written? What, what brings about this writing? Why Paul writes a letter to a church he's never been to? Well, again, this is a great question. I'm glad you asked. Paul was in prison. And this is probably one of his earlier um, times in prison. Uh, perhaps first time in prison, house arrest. It was a little more laid back, if you will. Remember, he was under house arrest in Rome. So Paul is in Rome when he writes this. And so Epaphras goes to him to get advice and counsel on some concerns that had crept into the church. So, again, imagine... Here is Epaphras in Colossae. The church is growing. There's people coming in. It's, you know, he's got some, they're just, they're spending some time. They're growing. They're, things are happening because it's a happening place. There's multicultures. It's a, this mixed dynamic going on. There's Jews. There's Gentiles. There's slaves. There's free. There's all these people that should be in a church. This diverse group is in this church. And so then there is some, there's some good things happening. He wants to go and tell Paul about the good things happening but there's also some concerns. And so what do you do? What do you do when you have concerns? You go to your mentor. You go to the person you look up to spiritually. Guys, can I just say this? We live in a day that's unlike most days. Now, I'm not mad at doctors and, and psychiatrists, okay? I'm thankful God has raised up people like that. Praise the Lord. But did you know for... Thousands of years, when people desired help, counsel, wisdom, advice, you know the first place they went? To the man of God, to the priests, to the pastors, to the elders, to the spiritual mentors in their life. And I know some of you still do that. Praise God. That's where you should start. Again, I got no problems if, you know, I'm not going to be able to help you with a broke arm. I'm going to tell you to go see a doctor. <laughs> right? So you don't have to worry about, Pastor, my arm's broke. Can I set up a meeting this week? No. Go see the doctor, then we'll talk. But you understand the point I'm making. There's a lot of things that we try to wrestle through on our own and we lean on the wisdom of man to solve problems and solutions and I'll take counsel from uh, all three of my drunk neighbors and, and my, my uncle who don't know the Lord from Adam's house cat and, and, and because it agrees with what I think I ought to do, yeah, that's a good idea, that's good advice. When instead, sometimes what we need to have is not our ears tickled, but somebody to actually tell us the hard truth in love even though I can't stand that. Can't stand it when they tell me that. Here's another revelation for you. You know the awesome thing about when you are the advisor and you give God's answer, if it's truth, even if they don't like it, that's not your fault. You're just the messenger. Now, it's not easy. In fact, I can tell you, this pastor's heart breaks and hurts him many a times because it's hard to tell the truth in love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. It's Proverbs. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Guys, you don't need... You don't need somebody to tickle your ears. You need the truth in love. And so, Epaphras knew this. He loved these people he was a part of in Colossae. He loved them. 
But he was torn because he recognized some things that weren't really in line with truth and he was struggling internally with how to deal with it. So he goes to seek counsel and advice from Paul. What were some of the problems? Gnosticism. This knowledge, higher knowledge that had crept into the church, you know. And, and if you want to know more on that, look, 1 John was written about that. That's where he talks about they, they went out from among us because they were never of us to begin with. This was a big growing problem. This idea that somehow maybe uh, anything physical, the material world was evil. And, and so just a, a lot of heretical teaching had begun to make its way into the church. Mysticism, there was this, you know, again, a lot of mystical practices. A lot of strange and bizarre things, again, that had been crept in because of the pagan world around them. Some of the things they, well, you know, we used to do this up at the temple uh, uh, of, of Diana, we, and so we ought to do that here. It, 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 we used to get a big crowd when we do that. You know, I was talking yesterday, uh, I, I was warning some of our church folk that today was a history lesson, and so we were concerned that it might be boring. And so I told them I was going to work on you know, something to keep it spiced up. So let me bring out my unicycle and fire juggling. Just kidding, I'm not. Guys, the Word of God is enough to excite us. It should be learning and studying and growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ should be enough to excite us, right? And it is, and I know... I know, this group. Epaphras was concerned, though, with some of the mystical things that were happening. There was worship of angels. There were people trying to encourage people, you know, in, in, in angelology, in this angel, in this angel ministry, and focusing on, on angels. I mean, you may know people even today. I, I, I know early on in my walk, I mean, it was people, you'd go into their house and, and, and there were angels everywhere. And it was like, it was almost like there was an idolatrous worship of angels. Judaism was also there. Again, I think it was mostly a Gentile crowd, but I believe there was a lot of Jews there as well. And so they were saying, hey, hey, Christ is good, but, but we need to add a few of these practices that, we, that, that our forefathers have done. And so you've got the philosophy creeping in, and that's why he's going to talk in one passage. Don't, don't be taken captive by vain philosophy. In other words, human tradition. A lot of the Jews were, were wanting to bring in some, some Jewish tradition, tradition of man, wisdom of man. And so these were concerns on Epaphras' heart and mind. Paul responds by writing three letters. He's in Rome, he's in prison, he's in house arrest. Epaphras comes to him to get some counsel. So Paul, in chains, begins to write three letters. Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Now this is very good, guys. That's the one we put these together. We just finished Ephesians. We're in Colossians. I invite you to read Philemon. It's one book, right? Short. Why Philemon? Well, here's the interesting thing. Philemon, what do you know about Philemon? Say that nice and loud, Larry. He was a slave owner. And he was in the church at Colossae. Now, who was one of Philemon's slaves? Say it loud. Onesimus. Onesimus. Guess where Onesimus is? He's with Paul. Well, wouldn't you love that, how that came about, that conversation? You talk about a sovereign God at work. Onesimus comes into contact with, with Paul there in Rome, and he's there in Rome. And, 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 and I always want to say Tychicus, but uh, anyway. They're, they're there together. Epaphras comes, and it's like, hmm, well, I need, some, I need to take care of some other business in Colossae. I've been talking with Onesimus, and he's a runaway slave. And so I'm going to send him back with a letter to his slave owner, Philemon, who also is a member of that church. You see how the picture's coming together? It's kind of good stuff. This is why we study the background. We get a bigger picture. We get a fuller understanding of what's happening in this church. So go read Philemon. So one of the problems, again, that's become known as the Colossian heresy. Gnosticism was a, was a great problem in the early church. A Gnosticism attacked the adequacy and, and supremacy of Christ. 
You'll see this, notice here in Colossians 1. By the way, uh, Chuck Swindoll breaks this down. I want to use a couple of his little points right here uh, in summation. But notice what it says here in Colossians 1 and verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All right? Paul is writing with purpose. He's going to say, look, this greater knowledge is not to have preeminence. Christ is greater than anything. Remember Hebrews study? Getting a little Hebrews lesson here again. The heresy in the Colossae church, it attacked Christ's role in the creation of the world. Notice what 117 says. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So not only do we realize that Paul's going to say, look, everything was created by him, created through him, and created for him. He's battling the lies. He's earnestly contending for the faith, Jude, with the truth. By putting eyes on Christ. It attacked the humanity of Christ. So what does Paul say in Colossians 1.22? 122, he says this. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. You can't die unless you got a body, right? Because they're saying, well, see, material thing, Christ, no, spirit, he's not, you know. Christ was the God man. He's fully man. He's fully God. Again, debunking the heresy that was being taught. It offered men human philosophy. Colossians 2.8. Again, Paul responds to this because there's this philosophy, this vain philosophy had been creeping into the church. Red flags up. What does Paul say? Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Not according to Christ. Philosophy is good when it's according to Christ because he's the origin of it all, right? But there was no doubt traditions of men, some of these things, practices of the world, human wisdom, don't lean on that. So here's the purpose of Paul and his writing. Again, he wrote the book of Ephesians. You remember in Ephesians? He dealt with the church. You, the body. That's what Ephesians is about. Equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. We unpacked Ephesians. But you know what? That's no good if you don't understand the book of Colossians is about the head. The head of the church. A body without a head is going to be all over the place, right? <laughs> And there's a lot of churches today operating like zombies on the vain philosophy of the world and its practices because they're not taking instruction from the head who's Christ. And so Paul needed to address this and remind the people there that Christ is to have preeminence. So, Christian life, relationship with Christ. Uh, Again, these are some things that we're going to learn in the purpose in writing to that church. He wanted them to know, put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man. Continue in the word, pray and watch. These are things we're going to learn as we go through this book. Relationship in, in the church, forgive, forbear, love. These are, again, things he's going to hit on and we will unpack when we get to them. In, in the family, submission, obedience. This is the Christian life. At place of work, he's going to talk about that again, using the Onesimus-Philemon relationship. He's going to help us in our day and age in practical use and application of how we're to carry out our relationship in the workplace and how we're to submit there. So we'll talk about that. Those are some practical applications. Some other practical applications. Believers have died with Christ, therefore we need to die to our sins. Practical study in Colossians. We've also been raised with Christ, therefore we must live well in Him and put on qualities that are motivated by Christian love. These are things we'll talk about as well. 
And because he's Lord over all, the life of the Christian is a life of submission to Jesus. Do you do what you do because of your love for Christ? Listen, pastor's going to ask you to do things. I don't want you to do things just because the pastor asks you. All right? I've even been known to tell people, voluntold. I don't want you to do that just because I've told you. Though in the household, in your household and in our household, sometimes you do that. I don't want you to do it for that reason. I want us to do what we do and all that we do for the glory of God. Because there's a love in my heart to want to submit and want to please Him. It's an attitude of gratitude. That's why we do what we do. Let's close with an overview, because I recognize I threw a lot of that stuff at you, and, and, and so in keeping with my conversation yesterday, it's a little entertaining, but it's also very informative. Check out this overview of Colossians. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter is addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he didn't start. This church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. And Epaphras had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall, but he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. So the letter opens with two prayers. Paul first thanks God that he learned from Epaphras that the Colossians have been totally faithful to Jesus, showing love for God and their neighbors, all because of the hope they have in the new creation that Jesus has in store. And so he moves on to pray that they would grow in their wisdom and understanding about Jesus. And then Paul has placed a poem here to help the Colossians and us do exactly that. It's the centerpiece of chapter one, a poem all about the crucified and exalted Messiah. It has two parallel stanzas and it's crammed with language and imagery from the books of Genesis and Exodus, from the Psalms and the Proverbs. The first stanza explores how Jesus is the true image of God. In him, the full character and purpose of God is embodied in a human. He's the firstborn, an Old Testament phrase about Jesus' royal status over all creation. He shares in the very identity of the one true creator God. And by him, all reality, all powers and authorities, spiritual and human, have been created. It's in Jesus the Messiah that we discover the very author and king of creation. And so in the second stanza, we discover he's also the one bringing about a new creation. He's the head of a new body, which refers to Jesus' people, who are the new humanity, of which his own resurrection existence is a prototype. In him, God's glorious temple presence dwells, and so it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that God has reconciled himself to humanity, to all spiritual powers, to all of creation. It's a remarkable poem, and Paul will keep referring back to it as he goes on in the letter. So he first shows how the truth of this poem transforms his own experience of suffering in prison. He's being punished for announcing to the Greek and the Roman world that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and King of all. And so his suffering, he thinks, is not a sign of defeat. It's actually his way of participating in Jesus' own suffering done as an act of love. And so his hardships are actually a cause for joy. He's imprisoned for the surprising news that Israel's resurrected Messiah is creating a new multi-ethnic family. And more, just as the divine glory dwelt in Jesus, so Jesus dwells in and among his international family. Or as Paul says, the Messiah is in you all, the hope of glory. Paul then addresses the cultural pressures that are tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. They were confronted by a combination of mystical polytheism along with a pressure to observe the laws of the Torah. 
So all these new Christians, they had grown up worshiping the various Greek and Roman gods who governed different arenas of human life. And many simply included Jesus as one more deity that they could worship. There was also great pressure from the Jewish Christian community for these non-Jews to complete their commitment to the Messiah by following all of the laws found in the Torah. Specifically, he mentions eating a kosher diet, observing sacred days, and circumcision. It's very similar to the problem he addressed in the letter to the Galatians. For Paul, to give in to either of these temptations is compromise. It's a failure to grasp who Jesus really is and what he did on their behalf. The Colossians used to live in fear of spiritual powers and elemental spirits, as Paul calls them. But Jesus triumphed over these through his death and resurrection. He freed the Colossians from any obligation to them. In the same way, Jesus fulfilled on our behalf all of the laws of the Torah, which never had the power to transform the selfish human heart anyway. And so what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, it lacks nothing. It doesn't need to be supplemented by following the laws. He is the reality to which all of the laws of the Torah were pointing anyway. Instead of the laws, followers of Jesus have the power of his resurrection to change them, which is what he goes on to explore. Following Jesus means joining his new humanity because their lives have now been joined to the risen Jesus' life. And this is why Paul challenges the Colossians to set their minds on things above, where the Messiah is seated or rules at God's right hand. Now, Paul doesn't mean here, think about how you'll one day leave earth and go to heaven. Rather, the heavens are the transcendent place from which Jesus rules now over all of creation. And from there, he will one day return here to transform all things. Or, as Paul says, when the Messiah who is your life is revealed, you too will be revealed with him in glory. So Paul challenges them to live in the present as the kinds of new humans they will one day become. He uses the image of their old humanity, characterized by distorted sexuality and destructive speech. For Christians, that humanity died with Jesus and has been replaced by his own new humanity, which is characterized by mercy and generosity, by forgiveness and love. And this humanity, it transcends the ethnic and social boundary lines of our world to create, in Paul's words, a people where there is no one Greek or Jewish, circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul then gets really practical and he shows the Colossians what this new humanity might look like in a first century Roman household, which was a highly authoritarian institution where the male patriarch held the power of life and death over his wife and children and slaves. Not so in a Christian household. Here, the risen Jesus is the true Lord. And so in the Lord, the wife allows her husband to become responsible for her, and the husband is subject to Jesus by loving his wife and placing her well-being above his own. In a home where Jesus is Lord, children are not objects, but are called to maturity and to respect, and parents are to raise their children with patience and understanding. Christians who are slaves are to honor their human masters precisely because they're not the real master. Jesus is. And Christians who have slaves are to understand that this slave is not their property, but rather a fellow member of Jesus' body to be honored and embraced in love. And Paul's walking a very fine line here. He is reshaping the most basic Roman institution around Jesus who rules by his self-giving love. And so while he doesn't abolish the household structure out Outright, the exalted Messiah demands that it be transformed almost beyond the point of recognition for any Roman living in Colossae. You can see this most clearly in the letter's conclusion. After a request for prayer, Paul applies these instructions about Christian slaves and masters. And we discover that Tychicus is the one carrying and reading this letter to the Colossians. And he's accompanied by a certain Onesimus, who was a former slave to a Colossian Christian named Philemon. And we discover from another letter addressed to Philemon that Onesimus had escaped from his master. It was a crime worthy of imprisonment. But Paul asks the whole church to greet Onesimus as a faithful and beloved brother in the Lord. And then in the letter to Philemon, Paul says that he should receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a brother. Talk about ending the letter with a punch. 
So in the letter to the Colossians, Paul is inviting us to see that no part of human existence remains untouched by the loving and liberating rule of the risen Jesus. Our suffering, our temptation to compromise, our moral character, the power dynamics in our homes, all of it must be re-examined and transformed. We are invited to live in the present as if the new creation really arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what the letter to the Colossians is all about. And I know what you're thinking. Well, no need to study it now. We just went through the whole book. No. Sorry it doesn't work that way. But what a good, again, overview. This is where we're going, Lord willing, in the days ahead. And I hope you'll be involved and be a part of this study uh, as often as you can. Practical applications. Are we following Jesus? Are we following after Jesus as we should? Is he preeminent in your life? And if he's not, if there's other areas that have priority, and only you can answer that, guys, and I want you to think about this as we close. Ask him. Is there something else that's got your priority right now? What's, your, what's got your priority? Because that place belongs to Christ and Christ alone. Let him have his rightful place in your life. Our faith in Jesus Christ should transform the relationships we have in every area of our lives, whether they be our homes, our churches, the world around us. Your life is a purposeful letter being written for others to read. What are they reading? This is the theme of Colossians the preeminence of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. May it excite us as we delve into this new study. Lord, that you would lead uh, as we unpack it, as we uh, study it. Lord, help us to not be deceived. Don't let us be hearers only. Lord, let us be doers. May the preeminence of Christ find place in our heart. May Jesus truly be Lord, not just fire insurance, not just a Savior. Jesus is Lord, and He is head of this church. This is His body. And so we look to our head. We look to have this mind in us which was in Christ Jesus. I'm reminded of Paul's words. He says, I beg you, I beg you, church, I'm begging you, church, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Lord, may our life be marked with sacrifices, giving up some comforts, being inconvenient. find that perfect and acceptable will of God. It's our reasonable act of worship. Lord, that we would live with Christ as Lord of our life, preeminent in our home, in this church, in our workplace. Transform us in our thinking change us in our actions and Lord may we be dedicated faithful faithful servants steadfast for the cause of Christ because your return is soon and may we be found in that day watching praying serving for your glory give us the strength to do what we cannot do our own strength. And we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Don't forget your care groups this evening. Um, Varner care groups at the left coast tonight. Uh, Piners, uh, Dean's groups here at the church. Five for Dean's group. And uh, I guess we announced Piners is still six, I guess, in the teen room. I haven't heard any different. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
Mark and Holly's, y'all's place tonight? Six o'clock. Place to be. Uh, so find your way to one of these and enjoy the study this evening as we begin to get into Colossians. Start reading Colossians, thinking about it, meditating on it. And uh, most importantly, be responsive to what God would have you do. Practical application even now. I know Pastor Nate's needing to meet. If you're even thinking about how could I help this club year, stick around. Hear the information um, of some things that are happening as we relaunch our Word of Life clubs starting in September on a new night, Wednesday nights. And even if you're saying, well, I can't really, let me encourage you. You can. There's a place, even if it's not here, some things I would like for you to, to think about doing. I'll be reaching out through emails and days ahead, parts being involved in a prayer team, uh, maybe helping with some snacks. So there is a way in which you can help. Please pray about that. Obviously, we'd love to have your physical bodies here, even if it's just helping to corral the cats, I mean the kids. So uh, uh, we'd love to have you. So Nate will meet down front afterwards. The rest of you, dismiss. Have a blessed day.